Sabbath. And happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, I know what you're thinking about that out on the World Wide Web now. That's what the kids are calling it, the World Wide Web. But we here in the Church of God, we love Thanksgiving. And uh, we're going to celebrate it today with a potluck. And given the fact that in the celebration department, between mid-October all the way to the spring, we're free. So we'll just celebrate this all year long. So I'd like to share with you, if I could, a Thanksgiving story. I think it is. I want to introduce you to someone that I think you'd like to know by knowing her life story. You probably won't need your Bibles too much for this. And at the end of it, I probably won't make any grand points because any points I would make about this girl's story would just be banal and pointless. This girl's story is current. She's 30 years old and she lives in the United States. And her name is Young Me Park. Young Me Park. It's spelled Y-E-O-M-N-I, but it's spelled, pronounced Young Me. And she lives in the United States right now. She's married, has a baby. But Young Me's story starts out in North Korea. North Korea. <laughs> yeah, I have perked some ears just saying the words, didn't I? The little rocket man himself. North Korea. She escaped from North Korea, goes to China, goes to South Korea, and ended up in the United States, where she's currently an activist. And she gives speeches about what's happening in North Korea. And I I want to share with you her life story, but I wanted to tell you the ending first because I want you to know this is a happy story. It's a story of triumph and it is certainly a story of thanksgiving, but I do have to begin with her life in North Korea. And it is not my intention to guilt you into gratitude today. You understand? Okay. But I have to cover it a little bit. So forgive me for that. And so, given the fact that I'm not going to make any grand points at the end of this, maybe just have these things in mind. One, this is a Thanksgiving story. And the other one is, just kind of have in the back of your mind, it's um, a story, an anecdote that Garnet Head used to tell, or maybe it was his daddy, I, mean, I don't remember. But it was the idea of this, well, my mom summed it up, and she would always say, what if the missionary has a flat tire? So Gunnar Ted's scenario was this little Chinese girl, because no missionaries are going to North Korea, I guarantee you that. This little Chinese girl, and she'd never heard the word of Jesus Christ. And the day before she's going to hear it, the missionary has a flat tire. And her immortal soul is going to be punished for that. So keep that one in mind, and I just want to tell the story. Is that okay? Does that work? North Korea. It's a little bitty country, way, of, I'll do it for you, way over in the far east. It's a little tiny, about the size of Cuba, Pennsylvania. Got about 25 million people in it. And it's, it's way far east. I mean, like so far east, if you start going around, it's west again, way over there. And to its east sits the Sea of Japan, Japan, and then the gigantic Pacific Ocean. Maybe you get to Fiji, Hawaii, then around the United States. On its west, to its south, sits another relatively small country called South Korea. And to its west is a gigantic country. And I'm realizing now, understand that this is like the Kamala Harris version of geopolitical <laughs> politics. I'm just trying to get to the Kims, okay? So there's a gigantic country that's kind of north, west, and south of them called China. And to the north-north of them is a gigantic 
what used to be the U USSR, Soviet Russia. And then we'll get to them in a bit, but there's a little tiny, moderate-sized country that sits on that border called Mongolia. And so in 1947, this is right after World War II, the country was what I understand just basically a monarchy, one thing. And then, so in 1947, the entirety of Europe just, everything from them all the way to the British Isles just lay in rubble, figuratively and very literally rubble. So what do we do with Germany? I don't know, man, put a wall down the middle of it. Y'all have one side, we'll have the other. And something similarly happened in Korea because the UN, God bless the UN, the UN said, okay, we're gonna make this country into a democracy. But Russia, the USSR, this is Stalin-led USSR, said, we don't want the West, and when I say West now, I mean culturally speaking, freedom-loving countries versus the East dictatorships. They couldn't have that that close to their border, even though that gigantic. They didn't want the East, the West creeping in. So in 1948, the southern part of Korea elected a president, and the north part of Korea elected a dictator. Yes, elected, or was installed by the... Soviet Union. So now you have these two little countries that used to be one country and we fought a war there basically trying to prevent the whole country from becoming like the northern country, the dictatorship. And so they installed their own socialist paradise under Kim Il-sung in 1948. And he reigned till 1994. Young Mi was born in 1993. So we've got three dictators of Korea. The first one is Kim Il-sung, 1948 to 1994. In 1994, he died, and then the little rocket man, Kim Jong-un, took over in 2011. And I'll get through all this as quickly as I can. But Young Mi was born in 1993, and so they installed the original leader in 1948, and of course he came in as a communist leader supported by them to set up the socialist utopia, the socialist paradise, communism. And the way he thought to do this was of course set up a class system, a caste system. And so everybody's starving, and then, so let's roll on to 1991, so 1991, the Soviet Union collapses. And this, for most of the world, is seen as a good thing, but if you live in North Korea, this is not a good thing. Because the country that refuses to produce anything now has no funding. So, I want you to understand when I talk about the starvation in North Korea, that it is not apathy. It's on purpose. So they saw this and they said, well, okay, we don't have any more funding. So we'll just set up this caste system and had 15 districts. Later on when she discusses, um, she gets to South Korea, okay, and she's in a Western country and she discusses, she, she was reading a lot and there were three novels she read. I, I bet you can guess two of them. Two novels she read that changed her life? 1994, 1984, <laughs> and Animal Farm. But when she was describing how the system was set up, there was another novel that she said, that's the one that the guy just must have copied North Korea. And it's a more modern novel. It's a trilogy. It's current. Young people liked it. And there's no vampires and <laughs> no... Uh, Witches, so that gives you a hint, but North Korea was set up and they had these 15 districts. And each of those districts was divided within five or six in each one, so the entire system was set up into 51 different classes of people in the name of equality and equity. 
The book was The Hunger Games. Did you know? Yeah. I had not read it. I'd seen the first movie, but I didn't know. And she's like, it was The Hunger Games. She's like, wow. He must have been copying North Korea. How do you get... Who decides which cast you're part of? In the book of the law, I won't have you turn to it, we're told that human beings are not allowed to persecute their, the sons for the fathers. But we're also told in that book of the law that specifically when it comes to the second commandment, that somebody does is allowed to persecute those generations for three and four and five generations. And that's God. Which category do you think Kimmel's song put him himself in? So, what is a crime? What would get you committed to one of these lower caste systems? Because the upper ones, they were provided food, but the lower ones weren't. What gets you in there? Can you climb castes if you marry? No, you can only go down. You can only marry down. And the thing that gets you put in that caste system is because your great aunt's uncle's cousin's neighbor said something about the fact that schoolwork in North Korea was silly. Thousands of people murdered for that. Literally. Literally. And schoolwork, and we'll get to the propaganda, but schoolwork in North Korea, they did have schools, but girls, people, they had math problems like if you kill four American bastards, if you have four American bastards and you kill two of them, how many? Everything she saw, everything, was hunger and death. Now, she had a lot of it. That was it. That was the only life she knew. It's very cold in North Korea. I wouldn't have thought it, but it's cold like highs in the summer of 60. Cold. So in the summers... Your diet as a citizen of one of these lower classes meant that you, you ate flowers. Uh, grasshoppers were your main source of protein. Um, then you moved into the fall where it was more like if you could catch a rat or a snake. It's a good story, I promise. And then in the winter, maybe you could have some frozen potatoes and that would get you to the spring which we view as the season of life, and they called it the season of death because nothing actually grew until the summer. So that's when you died in the spring in North Korea. They had collective farms. You're required to work at them. But a funny thing about these community farms is that 98% of the produce went to the regime and 2% went to the farmers, members of the party. Well, as you may have noticed, that adds up to this communal farm, 100%. No food for the people. You work all day in these communal farms. She saw death. You wouldn't think this woman, you would think that her, that her, Vessels, ice water ran through them like she couldn't get emotional about anything, right? And she did describe, some, describe something that she got emotional about, or she did multiple times. And it was a, it, it was a image she saw of hunger. And it wasn't the image itself. It was her sadness over how that little girl felt that day in seeing this image. So there's three stages of hunger they would describe in North Korea. I forget what the first stage is, but the second stage is delirium and laughing and stuff like this, which is, of course, illegal in this country. That's unfortunate. And the third stage 
is to where your, your external, you're so malnutrition, malnutritioned that your body cannot hold its organs in. It's a good story, I promise. And she describes herself as seeing this as a little girl, eight, ten years old. And she saw this, and she describes a young man in stage three, there on the street. And he's in stage three, and there's flies, dogs, not waiting. But he was still conscious. Conscious enough to still be begging food. And she weeps because of what that little girl felt. Looking back on it, she's like, 18 years old, what did I feel? She described it in one word, and this is what broke her heart so much. That emotion, one word, what was it? Despair? Fear. Fear. Anger. Anger. All good guesses. Think poorer. She saw death in the streets. Death in the hospitals, bodies piled. Death floating in the river. Death at the train station. She weeps because that little girl felt nothing. This is their world. They don't have the internet. Not only are they starving into death, you know, slavery, it, it, you, you keep the slaves ignorant. She'd never seen a map of the world. She thinks she, she doesn't know she's Asian. She thinks she's of the Kim Sung Ul race. Kim, Kim Il Sung race. That's her race. She's heard about Americans because they, they don't have pictures, of course, but they have these paintings of them, and they are long-nosed, green-eyed reptiles that rape women in South Korea. And when I say cold-blooded, I don't mean, like, vicious. I mean, they think they're actual <laughs> reptiles. Yes. This is her knowledge. She describes a scene later in, in South Korea, and I, I will get to that, I promise. But she describes a scene where her, she was experiencing freedom, and her mom was there, and she had brought one of her white friends. And her mom kept touching her. She got a little drunk. <laughs> she kept touching her to make sure her skin was warm. This is what they lived with. There's no concept of anything at all. So, she escapes to China, but she would reject the word escape. There's no escape. There's no word for that. There's no word for love, as you would have it as an, for another human being. The only word love you see is in the written form for the leader. There's no word for compassion. There's no word for any of those nice things. And you know what else there's not a word for? Any of the bad stuff. There's no word for depression despair, pain, because how could you possibly be depressed in this socialist paradise? So she finds herself living on the northern border, or the eastern border of uh, North Korea and China. And it wasn't though she intended to escape, although they had set up a plan for her to do so in a, with a woman that she had met, is that they were close enough to the border that there was a Chinese city over there. And she perceived there were lights. And that meant there was perhaps a bowl of rice. She wasn't trying to escape. She thought she'd come back. But if they've got lights, because North Korea, if you look at a map, you know, one of those satellite maps, it's a black hole. They don't have electricity. The train station I mentioned the dead bodies in, the train runs once a month. 
and people put, have to get out and push. So travel's rough. But anyway, she sees these lights, and she thinks, okay, she's 13, 15. Let me talk about the age a little bit, because if I sound like I'm off, um, American age versus Korean age. So when you're born in Korea, the day you're born, you're one years old. So they're counting the gestation period. And that, like, that's true in South Korea and other cultures, so she's one. But in North Korea, you turn two the day January 1st, or the first of the year. And the first of the year, of course, is the day that their supreme leader was born. She was born in October, and she was two in January, and everybody else is, has the same birthday because that's when the supreme leader's birthday is. So she's 13, 15, and she sees these lights, and her and her sister somehow come into contact with this lady that says, hey, I can get you to the lights. Again, she rejects the notion of escape. It's not it. So her sister and her got in contact with this lady. They found her somehow. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. But she said, okay, we're going to leave on this date. And her and her sister were going to leave. And she got appendicitis. <laughs> and so her sister left without her. And don't think of this as some kind of betrayal. I mean, it was time to go. And who knows where sister is? Because when people disappear, they don't get looked for. Not by the authorities, not by anybody. It's just a thing that happens. So she's in the hospital with an appendicitis. And so her sister leaves. And she's in a hospital where, of course, they don't have electricity and they don't have anesthesia. And if they did have anesthesia, they were using it with the same needle on every patient. And there's dead bodies in the hallway, dead bodies on the way to the outhouse of the hospital because it doesn't have electricity. So her sister leaves and leaves her a note. And she leaves her a note and it says, contact this woman, she can get you out. Again, to get a bowl of rice. So she contacts the lady and she says, okay. She finds her and the lady says, we're leaving today. You have to leave, you are leaving today. Today, right now. And your father can't come. Uh, her father had his own experience in being in a concentration camp because he was trading spices and metals, but your father can't come, and I need you to lie about your age. You're not 13, you're 18, and you're not 40, you're 30, and you're not mom and daughter. And so they struck out one day over a couple mountains. We might call them hills, but mountains enough if it's 10 below zero, and she reaches this the Yalu River, which is the border, you walk across it if it's in the winter because you leave in the winter because there's less likelihood that there's guards who will shoot you on the spot. Now, they actually, I think they left in March, so there was a, it wasn't that solid, so you still have to worry about that. So they do that for about 24 hours, the whole thing, no gloves, no hats, and all that stuff, and... They get picked up there by some Chinese guards. Not North Korea, but the Chinese guards. No, that's wrong. They get picked up there by sex traffickers. Because it's one or the other. And Chinese guards will send you back to North Korea. Which is where she was gonna go anyway, but anyway. So sex traffickers pick her and her mom up. And it's then she learned that the reason that she got by all the guards in North Korea is because the lady that told her how to escape sold her. Mom was 300 bucks. No, mom was 65 bucks. Her as a virgin was $300. And she says today she is not more thankful to anyone on this planet than that girl that sold her into slavery. It wasn't easy from there though, so she, they're sold into slavery, and I'll spare you some of that. You know what it is. She learned what sex and rape was by seeing it with her mom. And it's not like she went, oh, that's what that is. She learned later, oh, <laughs> that's what that is, and that horrible thing you saw was it. And, of course, she learned on her own about that. So 
She saw that because her mom gave herself with the first traffickers. And so she avoided it. Her mom gave herself up. And that's where she saw it. And you get there. She's there. And they're doing the whole thing, like checking her teeth, looking at her in this little house. And so here are your options. They don't, they don't have to force you into sex trafficking. You can do this. Or we can turn you over to the Chinese guards. Or you can go back to North Korea. And so it's kind of like, she would say today, if you have the choice, never choose starvation. And so they're sitting there, and there was one thing she saw. So the first thing she saw that was weird and different, like an object, where she started telling her mom, we don't need to go back to North Korea. No, let's stay. Let's do it. Let's stay. And the thing she saw there, this is in China, in a little private house, was a trash can. She didn't know what it was. Now, when I first heard her say that, I thought, oh, right. The government doesn't provide trash cans, and people can't afford trash cans. She lives in a filthy, filthy country with trash all over the streets. That's not it. That's not it. Think poorer. She didn't have the concept of trash. So the lady told her, she's like, when you have something in your hand that you don't need anymore, you can discard it there. Huh. Because when young me has a wad of her own hair in her hand, human hair will burn. And you save it. They had poop wars. Her words, not mine. Poop, that's what I said. So the government, with their communal farms, they don't produce any fertilizer. So your family might be required at the end of the year. Yeah, you don't have taxes in this socialist paradise, but uh, we're going to need one metric ton of poop from you. Now, I know you don't eat, and so that means you only poop about a couple times a month. But we need it. Or you die, your family dies, third generation. So she describes it as poop wars. They had outhouses, you locked them, you would die. They went to school every day, and if you weren't assigned a job already, you spent your afternoon looking for poop. Not enough human poop, you can look for dog poop, except the fact that somewhere in there, the uh, supreme leader decided that people having pets was too Western, so he confiscated all the dogs. You still have wild dogs, but so there's not a lot of dogs because that was too Western. You cannot have a relationship with another person, much less a dog. So dogs were hard to find. I'll just say this in one sentence, but if you happen to get meat from the black market, you weren't worried that it was dog. Enough said? Okay. So she gets there, and she gets sold to a sex trafficker, and he's very impressed with her. She's already been to, through two sex traffickers now, and he's very impressed because she's still a Okay, and so he, he wants her to be his like, mistress, like his own, and that's really a good thing. It actually is. So the first time, the first trafficker, her mom gave herself up. The second time, she said she just fought like hell, and thank goodness he had a mistress in the next room. And so he's like, whoa. And he showed her a phone, and he said, this is a phone. And look at all these pictures I took. And she's looking through the phone and these pictures and forgetting that her amazement with that, one of the pictures was of her mom because he had sold her. And he said, tell you what, 
You be my mistress, I'll get your mom back. Uh, and also, I'll get your dad from North Korea. And he managed to actually do that somehow. Oh. So, I'll get your mom back. You be my mistress. Sure. Sounds good. That happened. Um, and then, so, so she describes him. She's like, in his evilest of hearts, he actually did, I think, love me. Because he became a gambling addict for two years, and he couldn't feed her anymore. So he freed her. So now she's a free girl in North, she's a North Korean girl free in China. Occupation-wise, you go to the streets, you go to a webcam. At least with a chat room, you don't have to touch people, so that's what she did. In the chat room, she met up with a lady a, a, a similar situation, and she started telling her about South Korea. She, telling her about South Korea, the country right underneath hers, and she started talking about freedom. No idea what that is, of course. She said something like, in South Korea, you can wear jeans, and you can watch TV. Wow, <sighs> freedom. So, she said, the lady in the chat room said, I know of this Christian organization, this Christian ministry in China. You can reach out to them. She, she told them how to get in contact with them. And so then you went to this Christian missionary group there in China, hidden in someone's house, and you learned all about Christianity. And if you accepted Jesus Christ, they would get you to South Korea. Right? And, man, of all the things, can you imagine when she gets to South Korea... You're put in charge of placing this girl in a Western society, education system. And so you ask her, you say, hey, what do you know about Africa? And uh, can you point to Nigeria on a map? And what do you think about the struggles of the white and black people there? And she says to you, what's Africa? What's a white person? What's a black person? But when she heard the Jesus Christ story from these missionaries, she got it just like that. She knew it. She's heard it her whole life. Now, before you will get all warm and fuzzy in your little feelings about that, she knew it because our Father in Heaven, Kim Il-sung, gave his only begotten son, Kim Jong-il. Her Western friends were like, just switch the names, baby. It's the same. And even though he is dead, he knows what you think. He knows what's in your head. He knows the numbers of hair on your head. Are you going to blame this girl today because she's not a Christian? What if the missionary gets a flat tire? She believes in God. Now, at the time, she did. She, she's there in China. Yes, I would believe in a rock. You're telling me about genes and TV get me to South Korea. So she gets to South Korea. They don't take her to South Korea. They just kind of tell her how to get there, and that means go to Mongolia. Mongolia, and here's a compass, and you cross the Gobi Desert. I'll skip over the details, but it's the coldest desert on the planet. And mom has no shoes, and there's a father and a grandfather and a toddler, and seven teenagers and all the things you could describe about that. So he gets to Mongolia, they contact the embassy. They had to come there and prep her, you know, make sure she's not some kind of Chinese spy, but she's finally in South Korea. And she experiences freedom for the first time. And as you can imagine, this is shocking to her. She can't get it. She was told in this country that if you study real hard and you work real hard, you're rewarded for it. That's how she understood the word justice. They took her at first before she actually got enrolled in school to a re-education re camp. But 
you know, the good kind because she needed to learn how to use ATMs, machines, uh, banks, go to the grocery store, a theater, what's a theater, what's a grocery store. And she said it was somewhere in this process that she really thought freedom was more trouble than it was worth and she would, if she had a sack of frozen potatoes, she'd just go back to North Korea. Why? What exhausted her? I don't understand. These people think all day long. They're asking me what I do with my life, what courses I want to take. Can't you just tell me? I can't. I have a mayonnaise? I can't. If I could just eat, I'd go back to North Korea where they would all tell me what to do. But she started to learn about freedom. And she started to get a a taste for it in South Korea, although South Korea wasn't all that great either because they're a very, very racist country, unlike ours. And they love their Western dollars, but evidently, they don't like North Koreans. And how do you tell a North Korean? Well, you can hear the depression and the despair and the weakness in their voice. And they're on average three to five inches shorter than everybody else in South Korea, malnutrition. So she experienced some racism, but she got a job as a, she worked in a dollar store. And one of the fun things that you might imagine is when did, the, when was the first time this girl ate until she felt full, right? She used to play this game with her, with her sister, and then it would be like, how many pieces of bread can you eat? Oh, I can eat 1,000. Oh, I can eat 10,000 more pieces of bread than you. Whatever you say, it's more. And the first time was actually in China, and she discovered that you can't eat that much. You've been 24 hours without food, and you think, man, when that sun goes down, it's time. Honey, do you want to eat at Ryan's tonight? No. I'm going to tear that buffet apart. <laughs> They're not going to even have a buffet the time I get there. And then you eat like two sliders and a french fry, and you're like, whoo. So she's, she's used to food that doesn't have fat, doesn't have spices, doesn't have any of those things. So it took her several years to get used to even eating a hamburger. When she first came to South Korea, here's another one. What if the first time you were given the option of having any food you wanted? The most delicate, delicate, delicate thing the big delicacy that you could possibly imagine. And she was asked, what do you think it was? Guess it. Good guess. It's about that big. An egg. She asked for a boiled egg. Because it's the fanciest thing she could possibly imagine. And she ordered as many of them as she possibly could and apparently the limit is five, because she couldn't eat more than five. But that was what she ordered, was a boiled egg. What about the other Western foods? Can you imagine how heavenly? Any soft drink likers out there? You like the soft drinks, the Coca-Cola, the Dr. Pepper? Oh, just a big old 12 ounce can of goo filled with acid and sugar and carbonate. Oh man, on a hot day, whoo, yeah. It must have been heaven in her mouth. She said, it was like fire in my mouth. I never had a bubble in my mouth before. She's like, they're pounding the back of my throat. I was like, what is happening to me? She's like, can you imagine the first time I tried champagne? Alcohol. They had alcohol, of course, in North Korea, thick, nasty stuff. But she never really tried it. Her first experience with wine. I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but this is when she's in the West. And she became an activist, a speaker, so she's kind of a public name. Her first time to taste of wine at a wine tasting event in Napa Valley, California. Can you imagine? Can you smell the oak and the nutmeg? They asked her to go to Burning Man while she was out there, too. She said, mm -mm, no, I'm not doing that. She also describes in California going to like the French Laundry restaurant. 
It's like a big high-end organic restaurant where they took her out and showed her, here's why it's $500 a plate, because it all grows directly out of the ground. Like, well, that's what we had in North Korea. <laughs> I just want portions. What do you think your favorite food is today? Guesses? No, I heard it. I thought <laughs> steak. Good old steak. She'll eat it every day because cows have more rights than her in her country. And if you got caught eating a cow, Thousands of people died, generations, generations, generations. So she eats steak every day, not only because it's the most delicious thing she ever put in her mouth, but because it's like a big middle finger to Kim Jong-un, which she learned in South Korea, to her surprise, the first time she'd seen a, not um, but the other one, she learned that our benevolent dictator is fat. because she thought he was starving too. On January 1st, she would say his birthday. She's like, please, dear leader, eat something so you can feel better. And he weighs 308 pounds and he's five foot seven. She's five foot four and weighs 114. This is what she thought. This is what her concept of the world was. So, moving along here, she, she became an, a speaker, an activist. She, she was big into education, man. She, she, once she got on it, within one year she got her GED. She read 100 books, learning English at the same time and learning to read, and read 100 books. And of course, she has a reading list. And she went to the first one she saw, which was the shortest, Animal Farm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right, so if you haven't read one of those two books in a while, and don't say I read them in high school. <laughs> if you don't have time to read 1984, Animal, Farms, Animal Farm is 80 pages long. And so she read that and she started giving speeches. However that happened, and she ended up in Dublin, Ireland, giving a speech there. And someone heard her speech and they said, you need to write a book. We're going to hook you up with an agent in the United States. We'll get you with the agent. And she got hooked up with the agent. And then she ended up moving there to the United States to write this book. That's how she got here. Her agent lived in New York City. Let me pause just a second. This was in, she got to come visit the United States previously, but she just never thought she would have the money to actually come here. And she got, she came here for 12 weeks on like a missionary outreach program in Tyler, Texas, for 12 weeks. But she, again, never thought she could actually live here. And to me, showing up in East Texas and then coming back and you're in New York, <laughs> that's, that's kind of like when the, 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 the explorers came and they landed in Jamaica and then everybody else came back and they landed in Massachusetts. They're like, what? <laughs> This is not what you told me about. But anyway, so she winds up in Freak Show, Freak Show Central, New York City. They literally drop her off on Times Square at night. She didn't get mugged. Not yet. <laughs> that happens in Chicago. But the thing she was so overwhelmed with was the light. She's like, I can't imagine it. We've already talked about their electricity, and she's like, but even in the daytime, the trees are brighter here. The sun shines brighter. The sky is bluer and brighter. And so she gets there. This is about October. It's around her birthday, so she's 23 years old. And in January, she gets enrolled in a university, Columbia University in 2016. Now you remember 2016. The wokeism has been boiling for about four years and now the orange man is in the White House. So they think they have every opportunity to just destroy this country. So she signs up for a humanities class 
it would be a humanities class. And she has to go into sensitivity training before the class begins. And for example, they said, well, young mean, what do you think it means when a man holds open a door for you? She said, well, it sounds like a sign of decency to me. I said, no, you have been brainwashed. She's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to get out of here. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's white patriarchy. That's evil. Capitalism is bad. What she knew about South Korea, the white capitalists that ruined everything, that's what she was hearing again. This whole self-reliance stuff, it's part of the patriarchy. The white man will bring you down. She got here and she had a kid and she married an American, a white man, and she said it was the greatest thing she ever saw in her entire life is seeing her son's birth certificate beside a white um, American name with an American birth certificate. And she learned at Columbia, she's like, so he's half Asian, which means he believes in meritocracy and hard work, which makes him the devil. And he's also half white, which makes him an oppressor. So he's doomed. That's what she learned. Her son was doomed. He was an oppressor. So she thought, Obviously, this is very, very weird for her, what she'd heard about the West. And she thought, well, maybe it's just in the academia, this craziness. I've seen it, man. It doesn't work. And then she got out, and she's still doing the public speaking thing, you know, and she gave like a, oh, she gave a, she did an interview with Jordan Peterson. And out of the blue, it wasn't even about what the, interview was about, he asked, well, what was your experience at Columbia? Which was terrible. It was awful. So Fox News called her and said, would you like to come on and talk about wokeism? Fox News had also had her on to talk about Korea and these other things. And all of her friends are telling you, why are you going that propaganda channel? She says, well, because the New York Times didn't call me. And Fox News didn't get mad when I did go to the New York Times, because the New York Times did call her, actually. CNN called her. Because one time she spoke out against Donald Trump. Now the phone rings. Don't get it twisted. She's not a Democrat. She credits Donald Trump between making the connection between China and North Korea is the reason that nobody in the West cares. So we got cell phones and all the rest of it. And China is interested in supporting North Korea because of not having the West and because of sex trafficking and organ trafficking and all the rest of it. And we and LeBron James need our cell phones. So that's why we don't know anything about this. And so she got asked the simple question about the wokeism and the, what she was seeing on college campuses. And she said she made a comment about it. And now seeing, she went on Fox News, and but later she said something about Donald Trump and now they want to talk to her. And the only, her only statement about Donald Trump was he was going to sit down with Kim Jong-un without preconditions. Which, think, that, think of it what you will, but from her perspective, yeah. But they invited her on for that. They did not want to hear about Korea. They did not want to hear about China. First world problems, obesity. <laughs> she learned that obesity was a problem in this country. She's like, I just, I, she said, I have sympathy for it now, these things. She's like, but coming into it, I just don't understand. Your problem is that the food is there. Well, you just don't put it in your mouth. I don't understand. It's too much, that's your problem? She couldn't fit these things in her head. She lived with some New York roommates who would call her crying because they went on a date and their boyfriend didn't call them back. 
I'm sorry that that's happened to you. So it took her a little while, and she's like, yeah, now? I get it. I get it. She, she weeps for this country. She's glad to be here, but she's scared. If only everyone could understand just the simple difference between equality and equity. That the concept of equality means equal opportunity under the law and that equity means equal outcome. And the only way to produce that is the deaths of tens of millions of people. And it makes her sad. But she still fights. Because she recognizes something in this country that, my goodness, not even us can recognize. Freedom is the exception. This is not normal. This is not normal human behavior. We know why it exists. Because of God's promises to Abraham. While we were cho chosen to be born here and young mean wasn't, well, I don't know, man. I guess you just have to chalk that up to none of your business. But you can be grateful for it. And you cannot see it destroyed. How do you do that? People say, well, all you can do is just pray. I hate that phrase. That should be the first thing you do is pray. And the other thing you can do is realize that you're a ripple in a pond. You really are. You can keep God's commandments as best you can. You don't think that'll affect the world? It will. More than you could ever possibly know. You're on the internet. You probably have a thousand friends. Not that you're out there bragging about it. Just you know what the commandments are. You know they're good for you. They know they're good for society. And you can try. Just try to keep some of them. It was Garnet Head. Maybe it was Herbert. I don't know. I'm mixing them up that talked about this scenario where, what if you lived, what if you lived in a country, a community, a neighborhood, where everybody kept the commandments? What if you lived in a neighborhood, a community, where people kept just one? What would that do? What if you lived in a neighborhood where nobody coveted what was that neighbor's? Well, I know it's real hard to love your neighbor as yourself, but if you didn't covet what he had, perhaps you wouldn't sleep with his wife, lie to him, murder, and steal from him. Well, that covers five of them right there as love your neighbor. I'm a big believer in fake it till you make it. That's why we have commandments, because it's not natural to us. Love your neighbor as yourself? I can't do that. Well, you could not sleep with his wife. <laughs> and and the same thing goes for the God stuff. How do you worship God? Well, let's see. <laughs> you should have no other gods before me. You should not commit idolatry, because that will get you punished for generations. You should keep the Sabbath day. I put it here for a reason. It wasn't for me. <laughs> what if there was one day that you were commanded to take off work? You ask any, anybody on the planet, and they would go, yes. But they won't do it. What if you lived in a community where nobody took God's name in vain? Nobody used it irreverently. Nobody used it to suggest damnation on something. But also nobody used it to say that it says something that it does not. To misrepresent it. What if you lived in a country where people said, God bless America, God bless our troops, and in God we trust? They didn't take those words in vain. Happy Thanksgiving. I 
encourage you to go look her up. You will waste your whole Sunday tomorrow. It's fascinating. There's all kind of interviews out there. She's on Fox News, everything else. Uh, she does an interview with Jordan Peterson and one with Joe Rogan. I would suggest the Rogan one because he's like a stand-up comedian, so he doesn't want to spend the whole time diving into the depths of her. You know, it's a little more fun. Uh, the Jordan Peterson one, he's a clinical psychologist, so he loves getting in the dark corners. You know, there's a lot of crying. But you will be better off having known her. Have a good